Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, the program says I'm a minister. I hope that A is there. Uh, I'm kind of in search of a title, an applicant for Professor Emeritus. For that fancy term just means you're an old dude who no longer teaches at Pepperdine. So uh, if you have your Bibles, I want you to open to the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be there. We're going to be at the Sea of Galilee today. And we're going to be talking about some incidents in the life of Jesus. We believe to be the Son of God who changed it all. We believe to be power, and the power of the gospel is here. If there's a word that is our sponsor for the day, the Sesame Street style, it's the word power. We fear a lot of things. We've been experiencing great fright over the earthquakes in Mexico, the shakings around here. We've recalled perhaps 1994 here. We've been at least vicariously experiencing the fears of those who are in places where hurricanes have demolished homes and then revisited. We are people who hear messages from doctors and others. And, and those messages sometimes bring a message of that we fear, the fear onset of death or of other struggles with health. What we're going to see today in the Gospel of Mark is there is a power that is capable of handling it and really overcoming all of that. And we'll be addressing it in the fourth and fifth chapters of Mark. Before we get there, I want to set the stage a little bit. The Gospel of Mark is different. It, it is the first gospel likely written. It was probably written somewhere around A.D. 64 during the first real persecution of Christians. It was written by John Mark. Early, early Christianity really attests to that. Papias in A.D. 130. Uh, and even Eusebius, who thought Papias was stupid, com basically uh, compliments him on his choice there. But they both said they had heard from the elder John, from John who had lived past A.D. 100, and that he confirmed that this was the gospel, really, of John Mark who is giving us Peter's gospel, who's telling the stories that he heard Peter repeating. There is a great authenticity to it, but it also carries with it the sort of drama of a documentary. It's, it's quick, it's fast-paced, it moves quickly through one episode of healing to another. It, it begins not with begats that put us to sleep quickly, sorry Matthew, but basically it is something that begins with the action of John the Baptist and moves quickly into the miracles of Jesus. The first ten chapters of the Gospel of Mark are all set around the Sea of Galilee. If you want to look at that area from a satellite and then got it zoomed in quickly, you could see there is a lake at the bottom of the screen, and that lake at the bottom of the screen is the Dead Sea. It is one that is not fed actively at both sides by the River Jordan. The River Jordan flows down north to south into it, but the little, I don't know, teardrop-shaped lake you see at the, at the top is what we refer to as the Sea of Galilee. But please understand, it is not a sea. It is a freshwater lake. It, it too, lies 850 feet below sea level. But because the Jordan flows in and out, and it is fed actively it is a freshwater lake, it is really quite deep, at least by the lakes I've experienced. It's over 150 feet deep in much of its place. It is not as large as you may think. From north to south at its farthest point, it's probably around 13 miles. At its greatest width, it's probably under seven miles wide. So from where we're going to be uh, with Jesus at Capernaum, uh, you're going to see that basically uh, we're going to travel a little bit. I'm going to try this. We're going to travel with Jesus from Nazareth to Capernaum where the first four apostles that would have been called, who are fishermen, are called there by Jesus. It's probably not their first interaction with Jesus, 
but rather he calls them to come and follow him. And they give up what would have been a rather prosperous business likely. We know that, in fact, this is a place that exported fish from the Sea of Galilee, one of its names. See, it's sometimes referred to as the Sea of Tiberias. Sometimes it's referred to in the Old Testament as uh, Gennesareth. Uh, the whole area, again, is a very vital economic region of the north. Uh, if you, again, were to go from here, directly over here, it's about 20 miles. So Jesus hasn't walked a lot. Remember that the whole country of Israel during the time of Christ is relatively small. Uh, in, it, it is uh, a little bit controversial with regard to the city of Sepphoris because it is a new city built by Herod Antipas and with regard to that city there has been some speculation that given the very short distance from Nazareth to Sepphoris a carpenter and his, uh, his father and son might have made the trip there to be involved in helping build that uh, city not so much the buildings that would have been masonry likely but maybe some of the cabinets and other things that went into them, the furniture. Well, that's a nice story, but uh, more recent archaeology suggests that that didn't occur until after AD 100. So uh, they probably would have been aware of this city if they worked six days a week in Nazareth and then did not travel according to devout Judaism. Uh, then uh, whether he even went to Sepphoris is questionable, I think. But you see something of the economic activity in this area. You do see that when he begins his journey, Cain of Galilee, wedding there, you may remember. A lot of other things that are going on, but our action occurs here around Capernaum and taking a boat ride across to, I'm going to say Gergesa, even though, again, if you know the Gospels, there are different attestations as to where he lands on the other side of the sea. And the truth is that the demoniac that we're going to hear from is from a region down here at the very bottom, this is the area of Gadarab, that would have been too far. So that's not where he encounters the demoniac. It's probably again up here where the shoreline is fairly rocky and craggy, but fairly close. Well, I don't want to bore you too much, but I kind of want to set, this is real world stuff, and it's happening in a place where there is a lot of activity going on. There are people who are even as today, and as we walk through these areas, uh, the Decapolis, the Ten Cities, is where the, the demoniac returns after the healing we're going to look at. There is a lot of activity that we would include the uh, around, oh, where you see the word Galilee on the map. You would be looking at probably uh, an area where... Uh, Jesus may have been, uh, as one of them said, we're going to build these three tabernacles here because, uh, again, Jesus uh, goes into the mountains and some miraculous things happen. As far as this area is concerned, uh, it would have been around in this area likely where uh, we've also had Sermon on the Mount and those kinds of things. So it is for ten um, chapters of Mark, the site of all the action. Modern times today... You can go and visit, and they will tell you that this is where the Mount of Beatitudes was, where he gave the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, they will probably not uh, encourage you to visit the Golan Heights, a uh, great danger in that area. Uh, Israel controls in modern times from, say, if this is 12, uh, all the way from around 3 all the way to 12, but the other one-third is controlled by its enemies to a large degree. This is what we're going to see today, right? I don't know how you viewed it, but in my mind's eye, that was a big boat. It wasn't that they were getting in this boat that looks like uh, I wouldn't even want to go across a little creek in. But that's likely very close to a commercial fishing vessel of the time. It might be that you would find a little bit more elevated uh, area here and that may be where Jesus is in fact asleep, but it's not much bigger than that. 
And an amazing thing happened a few years back in the 1980s. Uh, some people discovered in the mud, after there had been a drought, uh, what is referred to today as Jesus' boat. And it uh, probably in this area right up here is pretty much preserved. Uh, the bottom part is rotted out and gone, but they've been able to reassemble that in, mu in a museum in Israel and is called the Jesus Boat because it's likely when you're hearing and reading this story, you're listening to a guy who's sitting uh, or sleeping in a boat pretty much like this. I wouldn't be perhaps afraid if that's what the Sea of Galilee looked like when I set out with Jesus and I was setting out with the Lord. I doubt that you would have either. I would have trusted in this boat that somebody who's expert, these fishermen would be able to get me from one side to the other. It's probably only about two and a half miles on the water, and they were probably staying relatively close to the shoreline. I don't swim, so I'm not sure how comfortable I would have been, but uh, essentially it wouldn't have looked bad if that's the way the water looked. If I began to see sights like this, I'm not so sure I would have been very confident. And I know if I'd have seen this, I would have been praying. Um, I would have been awakening Jesus as well. Well, um, we're going to eventually get back to this kind of peaceful Sea of Galilee. What I'd like for you to look at as you look at this Gospel of Mark yourself is again, emphasis on fast-paced action. It's a breathless pace. How do you read Mark? I think you read it, you just sit down and read it. I think that you should read it the way the people who received this good news message, this gospel, this story, that you read it with some care with regard to probably looking at maybe you could finish this whole gospel. It's only a very short writing, and you could probably read it all even just casually within a 15-day period. And I would encourage you to do that. Just read it and fall in love again with the power of Jesus Christ and what He accomplished when He came to be here with us on planet Earth. If you take a look with me through scanning the text very quickly, I think it answers to some degree His power and His message and what He's trying to do. If you take a look at the, the text as we turn through, around the fourth chapter beginning, you will see there's a parable of the sower and the sowing of the seed. It talks about the spreading of this story of this seed. But very quickly at the end is the story I want you to look at. That day when evening came, verse 35, he said, to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, and by now, because of the miracles, crowds were flocking to be with Jesus. They wanted the miracles. They wanted to hear the distinctive, powerful way in which he taught with authority. So they left the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up. And the waves broke over the boat, and it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Don't you care, Lord, we drown? Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey Him. What are you afraid of? We touched on a few of those things, but what is it that we fear? Is it living a life that doesn't matter at all? Is it fear of public speaking? Is it fear is it fear of the storms? Is it fear of disease? Is it fear of death because of violence? What is it that you're afraid of? For people who are afraid of the marketplace uh, and agoraphobia, they're, they're 
afraid to get out at all. And Jesus wants us to be people of faith. Jesus wants us to be people who are willing to accept the fact that in this world there will be storms. In this world there will be things that aren't exactly the things we want to happen. But are we going to be people of faith who trust the Lord in those moments? Mark demonstrates the power that Jesus has. Mark demonstrates that in in reaching out to simply still by His voice, the seas, the, the stormy sea, that God alone in Jesus has power over the elements themselves. For the ancients, the moving of the waters were even things of evil spirits. I, I, I don't, the Scriptures don't confirm that, and I don't really think that to be the existence. I doubt that you do either. But they saw in Jesus the power to control even the elements themselves without regard to those natural storm kinds of things that we see 24-7 on the Weather Channel. Uh, anything that can alarm us, concern us, we see there, right? Jesus is our protection even in those times of need. Power over the elements themselves. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat... A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Why did I jump to that? I don't know about you, but it's more terrifying to me to deal with the madness of the cultures and the breakdown of culture that we experience now. I'm much more frightened for America, for the world, uh, because of the breakdown of civilization than I am about storms. I, I know the power of those storms that hit Houston. I know the power of those storms that hit the uh, islands in, in Cuba and, and uh, Florida. I, I know that that's should frighten me, but that's a long way away. I'm frightened instead about the fact that we can't be certain any longer who's flipped out and doing something really crazy. In this case, we have a, a condition that existed in the time uh, being filled with demons, with being demon-possessed. I'm not here today to discuss exactly what that means because I don't know. I don't think anybody knows precisely what it happens, but I, I can tell you that you've experienced seeing that in other people who are totally out of control in one way or the other. Have you never been frightened when you've just walked into a public area in a city like Los Angeles or you've been in Europe or any place else and there's somebody there who is out of his mind and they're frightening characters? That's the person here, but he is incredibly strong as demon possession seemed to do in the time created this person of supernatural almost like strength they're able to break the chains they're, they can't be bound they live in the, among the tombs area where they buried their dead nobody wanted to be there and everybody was frightened of it have you seen some people who are out of control in our own culture perhaps Somebody encouraged them to try something and they tried for the first time in their life some drug, some chemical. They became wholly addicted and the star football quarterback suddenly is, his body is changing, the look is changing completely, wholly dependent upon the painkillers that he was prescribed by a doctor or by those illicit drugs that he tried. You pair it ever read the story of Josh Hamilton uh, who didn't work out so well for the Angels but a baseball player who was the number one overall pick, the superstar that was going to be and nearly destroyed his life on drugs. Have you ever dealt with people who are whose life is totally out of control? I think that's what this story deals with. Is dealing with that which we can't deal with. That that part of life where people are just so totally out of control that they have no way to cope with 
daily living at all. And Jesus comes, and even from a distance, the demoniac sees him, and he says he, the text says he fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Those who weren't Jews often referred to the God of Israel as the most high, son of the most high God. What do you want to do with me? And Jesus saw him from a distance as well. And he said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And he sent them and they went into the pigs, and the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and they were drowned. An interesting thing happens after that, and that is that the people who tended the pigs, who were pig herders, uh, got really upset. They were afraid, but they were mad. You just destroyed our whole livelihood. You destroyed our ability to make money. And they begged Jesus to get out, to leave them. All but the demoniac who's sitting there now and clothed and in his right mind. And he does what a new convert to Jesus frequently does. He begs Jesus to let him go with him, to be one of his disciples, to walk with him, and just be one of them. He wants to be a minister, a preacher, whatever. And Jesus does something different. Why is it different? Seven times in the Gospel of Mark, you see Jesus hiding from the fact he doesn't want the crowds to get even bigger. He doesn't want them to take him and try to make him king. He, he, it isn't time yet. And he says, often, go your way, but don't tell anybody. But in this case, to the demoniac, he says something quite different. This man who's now sitting there clothed and in his right mind, he says, go back to your home in the Decapolis. Go back and tell your friends and neighbors, your family, how much the Lord has done. Go back. Tell it. Tell them how much the Lord has done. When I first came here and seeing Monica this morning, I almost wanted to ask permission and I thought I'll get forgiveness. But uh, Ed Heller was very much alive and active and just a, a wonderful member of this church. If you don't know the story of Ed, Ed, Ed is, and Monica, of course, lived next door. Ed used to say, God wanted me to be a Christian so much that he built a stinking church building right next to my house. Ed was the guy who was out of control. It wasn't necessarily that he was filled with demons. It is that alcohol was his demon, and it was in control. And Ed was the guy who used to take his guns and go to the center of what was then the little dusty town of Simi, and shoot him up in the middle of the night. He'd be arrested. They'd let him go the next day. But he was the town drunk. And Ed is the person who could go back to other people who struggled with alcohol and other abuse of drugs. And he could minister to them. He could talk their language. He knew what the condition was. He could tell his story of how God came to him next door. And he learned what it meant to be forgiven. He learned what it meant to be a child of God. To be adopted into the family of Jesus. And to live his life to the praise of God's glorious grace that he felt so effectively in his own life. You and I need to do that, and I'm going to talk more about that in the next two stories. Notice these stories, all about power, the power of God to overcome our addictions, our dependencies, our dysfunctions, and the power of God to use us in the right ways in life. The next thing that happens is that there is a woman who is unnamed, a woman who is violating Jewish law, but she is so convinced, has so much faith in the power of Jesus Christ that she says, if I but sneak into this crowd, why sneak in? 
she's unclean. She has a menstrual flow. She's had that for 12 years. She knows the frustration of going to a doctor and they give her various remedies. She spent all of her money on doctors and nobody can cure it. She's supposed to stand at a distance and shout, unclean, unclean, so that nobody comes and touches her. And yet she says, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed by Jesus. And the text says that that's exactly what she did. She sneaked in. She went through the crowd trying to avoid people as much as she could. And she touched the hem of his garment. But it's Jesus she's dealing with. And the text simply tells us that he knew that the power had gone forth. And that he said, who touched me? And his incredulous disciples, right? Lord, you're in this crowd of people. A lot of people are touching you and want to touch you or pushing around. And he just say, who touched me? And she knows that he knows. Now, it's as embarrassing then, maybe more so, as it is now. And yet, what does he do? Does he say, your face made you well, go away? No, does he, he says, And she begins to tell the story of what has happened. It's an embarrassing story of uncleanness, of a condition that, imagine, during the time they didn't really even understand, not nearly as much as moderns do. But she tells her story. Why? I think there are a couple things that happen here. First of all, she needs to know this is not some kind of superstition. If you've traveled Europe, you know that you can find numerous fingers of apostles. You can find other parts of the body. You can buy bones. And you can even probably buy those relics if you want. And people seem to superstitiously think the power is in the relic. I I suspect that there are more nails from the cross that have been distributed around the whole world than existed in the time of Jesus. But whatever it is, we seem to want to hold on to some kind of magical superstition. And Jesus wants her to know it's not about that. It is about your faith. Your faith has made you whole. There are those of you here who are struggling with things far more serious, perhaps, than this flow of blood. And I can't wave a magic wand. I can't perform some kind of ritual and see that you're healed. I can tell you a story that happened in this church that brings some hope. I was asleep. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. My phone rings, and I answered it, and on the other end was a a man choked with grief, highly emotional, upset. He says, Mr., you don't know me, but I used to be a member of the Simi Church, and I understand that you're the preacher there now. He said, "I, I, I don't know where to turn. My wife has had a massive heart attack, and... And he started crying again. And I said, I'll see me Adam again. I'll be right there. I, I came and I went. And I want you to understand that this is, you know, I'm, I'm from the Church of Christ, right? So I, I, I'm not thinking so much when the doctor says, and I was there with the family when the doctor said to Les Page, your wife has only probably 24 to 20, 48 hours maximum to live. She's in need of a heart-lung transplant, but she can't get to a center even if there there was a heart available and even if there were lungs available. So what do I do? I prayed for comfort for the family. And her oldest daughter, Leslie, said, I don't want to pray for comfort. I want to pray for the healing of my mom. And a humble preacher said, let's pray. And we prayed that... Lonnie Page would be healed, that she would live. I performed Lonnie Page's funeral ten years later. I believe there is a reason that God chose to extend her life. Like you and like me, Lonnie was going to die. It just didn't need to be at that moment when she was out of fellowship with Jesus, when her family had not accepted Jesus Christ, many of them. And 
in her coming. Until they moved away from this area, Lonnie sat to my right now every single Sunday. It took some time, but eventually her daughter, uh, the youngest daughter, Summer, uh, went to Harding University, ended up playing volleyball a little bit there, and then uh, ended up getting an MBA, became a Christian. Her family less returned to the Lord. I am out of touch with the family, but I just tell you that God has the power to heal if it's necessary. That God, if in His grace and wisdom, believes that it is the time to extend that life, God has the power. And when that happens, you'd better believe that Lonnie Page was effective in telling other people about the gospel, the joy of the good news in Jesus, and her joy of being restored to the family of God. In that crowd, there's another reason that I think she needed to come forward and tell her story, that her faith in Jesus and that Jesus had healed her. In that crowd is another man named J. Iris. In fact, it's the reason Jesus is going from point A to point B, right? It is that Jairus has arrived and he said, my daughter's really sick, come go with me, you can heal her. And Jesus agrees, he's going. And the crowd's going to his house. A servant arrives and that servant says, Jairus, don't bother the teacher anymore. It's too late. Your daughter is dead. It's too late now. The, news, the worst news that any parent could ever possibly have, your daughter is dead. But Jesus turns, and he's able to say now, after he's just heard, he's just heard, he's just witnessed this incredible power of healing a demoniac, this incredible power of healing the woman with the issue of blood, and that faith has made the difference, Jesus now turns and says, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Part of my role as, as a minister and your role as a minister is sometimes just to be there and to hug, to hold the hands, to cry with, to touch people who are experiencing great fear. And our ministry is to say, I don't have the words. I just know that the only way forward is in the arms of Jesus. And that some way, in a way that you don't understand now and I don't understand now, you will find hope to overcome even this most difficult time. Because you will know and realize that life does not end here. That life does not end in the grave. That life lives. That life, what real life is, what is the real. Bill Henniger and I enjoyed very much the C.S. Lewis conferences. He enjoyed them so much that he, he took Patty back and they went again. It is one of those things that is exciting because you're hearing people, some of them the great minds of our time, testifying to the power of Jesus Christ to make meaning in this world. That's what C.S. Lewis said, really, didn't he? There's one quote that I have in my office up here now, and that is that uh, he says, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun. By it, I see everything. By the light of the gospel, we see God's truth. We see what Lewis described as the real. It's really a dualist position out of uh, the ancients that looked at the fact that this is but the shadow lands. If you saw the movie about C.S. Lewis and his short-lived marriage, his wife of, of his late years, and then she died uh, just a very short period after their marriage. Uh, he is grief-stricken, but th he talked about this world being a place where Satan still has some power. This world being a place where death still seems temporarily victorious. Even he struggled when joy died. But he realizes, as you and I do, that, that the, the grief is in losing this loved one who's still really so much here. The grief is in our lives changing in a way we didn't want. 
the joy, the everlasting joy, is that life lives on. And through the power of God over life itself and death itself, Jesus has already earned the victory, won the victory by His death on the cross. Death has been defeated. John Donne, the preacher and poet of old, Death be not, be not proud, for though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not so. Death, you're just one short sleep. What's he doing? He's paraphrasing the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Death is just a sleep transition for us to an eternity with God, a day when Jesus returns and the dead in Christ will rise and meet in the air and there will be a new body that is imperishable and mortality puts on immortality and victory is ours forever and ever. Does it make the grief any easier? I think it does. It just doesn't take it away. We mourn especially those kinds of losses that come when a little child is taken from us. Because we wanted to hold them close, love them, and be loved. There are struggles out there that I, I know you don't want to go through. I don't want to go through. But we'll get through them because we have hope. The power of God is there to say to us, have faith. Don't be afraid. Just believe. As I warned Al, I never know what I'm going to say or how long it's going to take. So I apologize if it's taken longer. But that's what I came to say. was really that there is a day coming. A day when that beautiful scene there will even look perhaps a little bit more. That's the demoniac area that I told him I was going to bring up and didn't. But a little bit more like this. Where we're not only at peace, but I want to even see that as the Son of God is coming again. And we are being called home. Don't be afraid. Just believe. With that, let's sing a song of invitation. Inviting you to Jesus.